Dr. Matt Poor, thank you for being with us today. I know it's a cold, blustery March day here in Virginia. We're both located in Virginia, but where are you at specifically? I'm uh, I'm at Virgilina, Virginia, which is on in Southside down near South Boston, uh, and um, right on the Mecklenburg uh, Halifax County line. Okay. Yeah, we've we had a unusually warm February, and I think we're gonna be paying for it a little bit here in March. But I know mid February, I was out in my own pastures kicking over some dung pats, and was noticing the the plethora of um, earthworms that always come into those pats and continue to like break them down. But also, interestingly, found some dung beetles as well. So. Um, they're still out there apparently in the middle of winter here in Virginia. I don't know if they're doing too much, but they're still there. Have you noticed that too? Yes. So uh, yeah, and and we do understand a little bit about that. There are there are species that come around um, all year long. So uh, of, of in in the twelve month cycle, there you you'll always be able to find some some species of dung beetles working, and uh, and so the the. The species varies, though, with the time of year. So some are more active in winter and some are more active in summer. And probably our most important ones are, are the ones that are active during the summer. So um, we get, you know, we get a lot of questions about like this time of year, a lot of people drag their pastures and people are, uh, you know, I've, I've had some people say, well, I don't want to do that because I don't want to disturb all of my dung beetles. Well, there are a few dung beetles uh, active this time of year, and they are what we call dwellers. That are the dung beetles that um, that may, mainly stay in the fecal pat all the time, and we can talk about the different types at some point, I'm sure. But but uh, they they basically they stay in those fecal pats, and there's not very many of them, and they're pretty small. And our observations yesterday, uh, as we really looked through uh, fecal pats of varying ages and such, and picked them apart, and looked for dung beetles. They were there. Uh, we identified uh, one species primarily uh, on this farm that I was on. But there was really not much impact. So there were, in other words, there were fecal paths that had been there for two or three weeks that were just almost like they didn't have anything in them. Uh, I mean, almost like they'd been undisturbed, you know, and there were dung beetles in them. So in the summer, when we have uh, other, other uh, species that are dominant, uh, the numbers are much higher and you can see a fecal pat melt away in two or three days. So it's very, uh, you know, it's very, uh, di the different beetles have different effects. But I think that also can help guide our management. So I, you know, personally, I don't think you're going to destroy your population by dragging this time of year if you want to uh, clean up those feeding areas and get the manure spread out and stuff to help grow more grass. I don't think that's going to undo any good that you've done having dung beetles. Uh, uh, whereas during the summertime, I would never drag pastures because we know that there, if you've got a population, they will take care of the fecal pats. And if you don't have much of a population, if you drag them every time, you're not going to have a pot. You know, it, it won't develop. So um, I guess my my love for dung beetles uh, started about uh, 20 years ago or so. And I didn't know anything about them. Uh, I, I, I actually, well, I knew a little bit about them. I had uh, seen them on um, probably Nova or one of those um uh, public television shows on the on the uh, savannas of Africa, rolling a big ball of manure around, and and those guys are definitely the sort of the movie stars of the dung beetle world, and that that's what I thought. That's that's all I knew about them. And I was a farmer in Virginia that had cattle and all at that time, um, but I had a, a kind of an awakening in the early part of my career where. I realized that pasture management was really all about understanding the ecology and uh, not and and being at you know uh, connected soil ecology, plant ecology, animal ecology, and that all includes all of the insects and you mentioned the earthworms and all that stuff. And once I started studying that pasture ecology and realized what a complex ecosystem it really is. Then I started looking, I, I started at home looking for dung beetles. And I had a chance to work with this guy named Wes Watson, who still works at NC State, but he's a, he's a, a good friend of mine and, and, and will retire soon. But w the one thing Wes uh, had uh, in his CV was he, he'd done work with dung beetles. And so I was like, well, that's okay, that's interesting. 
So he took me out in the pasture. I said, well, we don't really have any at home. And he said, well, they're everywhere. So you just don't know how to find them. So he took me out and showed me how to find dung beetles. And then I went home and wow, they were everywhere. We had, we had dung beetles and I just had been totally ignorant about that. So it actually was a kind of a, a entry point for me to realize, oh my gosh, if I didn't know about those, what else don't I know about in this system, you know? And so it's a, so it's, they're very fascinating for that reason. And one of the things that we found after we started, you know, seeing them and realizing how to, how to reliably find them and stuff, then in our workshops, which we do a lot of grazing management workshops with our program, Amazing Grazing at NC State. And so we realized that all it took was basically a, a, the right manure pat with a lot of dung beetles in it. And once the students see that, that's, they, they've got that same thing I had, that switch like, oh my gosh, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. I mean, it's real common. And, and so we, and so people are like, oh, I didn't get a picture, you know, so then we do it again. And they're, they're you know, it's a, and, you know, I, I'm sure there's a few people that think, oh, well, they've just got the setup. This must be a setup. This is too, this is too easy, you know? So we, we do it. And, um, again, and they get, they say, we say, get your cameras all ready. And the way that we do this is by taking a flat shovel and scooping up underneath the cow pie. And when you do that, the dung beetles that are in there, the, the, the tunnelers, which again, we can, well, we'll, we'll come back to that, but the tunnelers that actually go down below the fecal pat, um, they, if they're in the, in, in the pat, as soon as they're disturbed, they want to go down their, their instinct is, okay, let's go to the holes. And they go, they try to go down. So when you flip the shovel over, they're all right on the interface of the, uh, of the shovel with the, with the fecal pat. And so it you know, hundreds of them and people are like, oh, and so, you know, a lot of pictures are taken and then people go home and they're like, okay, they go to their pastures and look for dung beetles. And, and once you get people going out and thinking about that and they realize these dung beetles are there, there, then they think, okay, what else? You know, this whole biology, soil biology, it's true. You know, this is this. And so it's kind of that, 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 uh, that uh, catch, you know, that we use to, to get people engaged. Uh, the other thing I'll add to that, I don't mean to just go on and on, uh, but children are fascinated by dung beetles. And so one of the things we have in the industry is we have, we're, we all need to get our kids interested and involved at a very young age in what we do. And because of the sophistication of tractors, the agrochemicals that are used, all of those sorts of things, a lot of people have pushed off getting kids deeply involved mm -hmm. until they're older, you know, and, and so I know I was, I, I got hooked on farming at like six or eight years of age, and, and I know now there's less, less kids are put on a tractor at eight years of age, let's just put it that way, and, and so, um, this dung, we found that this dung beetle thing, the kids are really, really fascinated by it. And so uh, we, we use that at youth uh, workshops a lot. And, um, and they, they do, once they see them, then they want to go home. They want to go out to pastures. They want to take a shovel with them and, and start studying soil health, which is what we, the bigger picture, right? It's the dung beetles are part of that, a small part of that big thing we call soil health. Yeah. Well, wow, that, that's a great introduction to, to dung beetles there, Matt. Um, and I, I've written so many questions down while you're just talking about all that. Um, just for our, our quick audience's sake, so that they know a little bit about what you currently are doing. You are currently working for NC State, right? That's right. I'm a professor of animal science, and uh, I've been there for 32 years. I, I work beef cattle is my commodity of focus, but I work with uh, again, direct that amazing grazing program, which has been around for longer than me, but uh, it's a great program and it works with all species uh, of livestock um, uh, from everything from horses, sheep, goats, cattle, uh, and then other more exotic type stuff. But we, we work with all, everybody that has pastures is our target audience. 
And our, the goal of the program is to get them thinking about this pasture ecology and, and becoming, you know, becoming part of their own ecosystem and, and seeing themselves as part of something as opposed to being standing outside a pasture and thinking you have control. You know, it's not like that. You are just part of that system. And you yeah. do what you, you know. I love that the comment you made earlier is that we're all connected in, in this and we really are. And, and I feel like currently nowadays we've become so disconnected. And I think that's a fairly common theme that's more and more um, uh, put out there in the news and, and just I mean, in everyday life that we're not getting outside enough. And I love that concept of taking the kids out there to dig through <laughs> cow pies to look for dung beetles because they are truly fascinating little creature. And if you've ever held one in your hand, you will understand how strong and powerful that little tiny thing can be. If you try to even keep your fingers closed when you're holding them in their hand, they will wiggle right through your fingers, no matter how hard you you try. But let's go back a little bit so that we can get a good basic knowledge of um, dung beetles. I do have a picture that I, I uh, snapped from your research paper for uh, um, in D NC State with dung beetles. And let me find it real fast and I will share my screen so that you can see it also and maybe help explain it a little bit to us. So this picture I love because it's a great um, illustration, I think that explains what you were saying earlier between like the dwellers and the tunnelers and the roller. So there's three different types of dung beetles. And, and these are all uh, basically the dung beetles are categorized in several different uh, genuses. Uh, you know, like there's like three or four genuses of, of dung beetles. Of course, they're all beetles, but all beetles that live in manure are not dung beetles. So that, that is kind of a, a little bit of a complication, but not every beetle you find in there is a quote, true dung beetle. But uh, of the true dung beetles, there's three categories. Uh, there's um, the, what's shown on this figure. Number one is the tunnelers, and they're the most uh, they're the most important and the most abundant uh, in many situations uh, in terms of their total biomass. Um, they tend to be a little bit bigger, some of them. But uh, so what they do, and, and what you're seeing there in that diagram, is that they live in the fecal pat. Uh, when they enter the fecal pat when it's fresh, and they right away start tunneling underneath it, and so they tunnel down from 12 to 18 inches, just depending on how deep the, the soil is, you know, they, they, they stop, I guess, when they get to rock or something, but they, they do go down about 12 to 18 inches and they start to bury um, little balls of manure from the cow pie down in that, in that uh, what we call a brood ball chamber, which is marked as um, both A and C on this one are, are brood ball chambers. And then they, um, they carry soil to excavate that chamber. They carry it back up to the top of the, of the pie. So with tunnelers, a lot of times you'll see little piles of soil that are up on top of the cow pie after a day or two of, of the dung beetles working on them. So again, they're very important because those, those, uh, those uh, passages down into the brood chamber are pretty big size pore. And so that's very important in restoring macro pore uh, activity in the soil. Now, the, the middle one is called the dwellers, and dwellers, often many of them, our most abundant ones, are a little smaller than the, uh, than the tunneling beetles, which are, I'll just tell you the, the couple of names, uh, Onthophagus taurus and Onthophagus gazelle are two of the, of the tunnelers that we, that we have, that we see a lot of in the summertime. Then of these dwellers, they're a little bit smaller. They live primarily in the cow pie, and they do lay their eggs in the soil right underneath the cow pie, but it's only two or three inches deep. So they're not creating those deep soil pores. And, um, and this time of year, in the, in the winter time, we have the, the few species that we have active that are, the, are some of those dwelling type species, and you can break up some cow pies and find them, but they're not really very abundant this time of year. Now, when we get into the summer, there's a little one in this area across Virginia that's very abundant called um, Aphodius pseudolividus. And it's, uh, again, there's like 20 species we've identified, but that one is a very small one. They're only about an eighth of an inch long. And you'd think they were insignificant, but when the population is high in the summer, 
they uh, they can completely shred that that cow pie into nothing but sort of its loose fibrous components in just a couple of days. And it's it's kind of shocking when you see that, but it 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 is true that these these little dwellers are pretty darn important during the summertime as well. Now they uh, they they have a special um, uh, ability to to highly aerate that cow pie, and uh, or whatever I mean, or any other species species as well um, is 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 also target for a lot of these. But they do like cow pies, and that's where we normally are looking for them. Um, but they will they will completely uh, aerate that and it dries out in about two days and it helps break the fly population um, uh, up. So it's a, it's kind of a natural protection against heavy fly populations living through in those fecal pads. So a real active uh, dung beetle population, uh, which we have during the summertime, you get a lot of these deep pores made by the tunnelers. And then uh, while they're uh, you know, while they're moving on to another cow pie, those shredders or dwellers are just shredding up that cow pie and, and, and aerating it fully. So uh, the third category that you see on the right are the rollers. And we do have rollers here, but they're relatively few. Uh, and uh, I think only one time in my whole career have I ever found and actually found a roller rolling a ball of, of manure in a pasture. Uh, and, and we know that there are, there, like I said, there's some out there, but the relative numbers um, we, we would find, uh, you know, tenfold uh, uh, the, the dwellers or the tunnelers that we would find rollers in a normal, uh, in a normal ecosystem. So hopefully if everything's working good, they're all there and they're all working in concert and, and uh, doing something with the feces that there is going to be beneficial to pastures. Now we know that, um, that, you know, there's some climate concerns obviously with uh, the way carbon moves in and out of soils and stuff like that of course we're all kind of studying on that trying to better understand it but one thing that we know about these dung beetles is they do aerate the soil better underneath those cow pies and that typically re can result in some benefits with uh, with less loss of, of nitrogen through denitrification in other words and it helps to prevent saturated uh, soils uh, which which is a good thing and so uh, we, we know we're, people are studying that, but there, it does look like there's some sort of some small, you know, some, some, some direct benefits of dung beetles and then the indirect benefits on pasture fertility and, and porosity and that sort of stuff are also really, really important. Wow. Well, that, yeah. I, and I like to get more into what dung beetles bring to the table in forms of, or in terms of environmental aspects and financial, but before we head that way. I had a couple of questions that popped up in my head during the explanation of the three different types of dung beetles. Um, and my first one was when you first were commenting, you were saying that not all beetles you find in dung pats are dung beetles. So how can you identify a dung beetle versus a different type of beetle if you're rummaging through your cow pies? <laughs> Okay, the way the, the best way to look, to know for you know to kind of get a hint about that, and again, there's a lot of species, and you're never going to be absolutely right one way or the other. But most of the ones that are dung beetle, true dung beetles, have uh, very unique uh, feet. So if you look at the end of their legs, and uh, I don't know if you you know we we there's obviously pictures of dung beetles available, but they 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 actually look. Uh, they have little, little sh sort of like spade-like shovels. You see both of those, uh, the Ontophagus uh, hectate, which is the one that you're showing there. Uh, it has those little, you see those little kind of appendages on its front legs. Yeah. And those are, those are for dig. I mean, that's digging, you know, so those are for digging through the cow pie, digging down into the soil underneath. These and uh, spikes in the front here. So most true dung beetles will have some of those kinds of structures on their feet. Uh, that doesn't distinguish between the gen genuses and all of that, but that's just a physical characteristic you'll see. If you see a beetle that like scurries along really quickly uh, and, um, and just looks like it's really fast, it's probably not a dung beetle. There's a few of those this time of year that are just, they're just opportunities tunistic beetles that are maybe carnivorous and eating some other little tiny organisms or whatever that are in there. But, but, um, but most of the, most of what you're going to find are going to be these guys. And, 
And you can use the technique I, I, I talked about with the flat shovel. That's the one I like to use because it's just easy and simple. The other thing, you can carry a bucket of water with you and you can just clunk that whole cow pie down in the water and they will swim up to the surface and, and, uh, and then you got to dip them out of there. You don't want to drown them, but, um, but, but either way uh, it can be done. If you the, the work where we actually quantify them and stuff is done more with the, uh, with the dunk it in the water uh, technique. And then you carefully remove all the beetles that come up to the surface. Um, the other one's not really quantitative, but it's just it's kind of more dramatic when the crowd sees the, Sure. Yeah, that's that's the that's the moment that you catch a lot of people's attention when they finally you kind of demystify the cow pie and, and the soil life that's going on in there and being able to see that happen. And if you got a good one with lots of uh, dung beetles, that's super exciting. Um, one other question I had while you were talking, Matt, was and I've I've researched a little bit and I know in Australia and New Zealand, um, they've been actually importing a lot of dung beetles into those uh, countries because the dung, the, the native dung beetle populations they had were not, um, were essentially weren't, um, interested in livestock dung and they were more interested in the native species dung. And so that brings me to my question of, are most of our dung beetles that we have in this area, are the, are they native or are they from other places like Europe and Africa as well? Yeah, so that's a great question, and and I'll I'll tell you that uh, it's both. We do have native dung beetles, and and the important thing to understand is there are dung beetles. Uh, dung beetles are something over the entire globe that have evolved to take advantage of of animal feces. I mean, basically, that's that's what they, that's their food. And so, because things are you know different, feces from different animals are different. You know, like from a deer, it's very pelletized like a sheep or a goat um, from from you know like buffalo or closer over to where cattle would be and that sort of thing so a lot of those native species evolved around uh, you know just one or a few species of wildlife and they then most of them are opportunistic in that they will come into cattle feces uh, if, if it's a, if there's a lot of it available but it's not like their preferred thing so um, dung beetles were imported uh, into uh, largely in Texas and Florida. And, and this, this thing started because um, we found out, we le learned the hard way that the heavy use of the, of the, um, of the dewormer ivermectin will have devastating effects on dung beetle populations. And I want to stress, I said the heavy use and there actually was the development of a sustained release bolus for ivermectin at one time about 25 years ago. And that product, especially, it was a slow payout over like eight months and it was, it would wipe out your population. And, um, and so we started seeing a lot of these native species had been kind of wiped out and we'll see, we, we had farms where uh, feces was piling up and there was just no, you know, there's no degradation. And we know now it's not just the dung beetles that were gone, but probably all, all of the soil insects that, that help break down manure. Uh, obviously unintended consequences, like we run into a lot with these kinds of compounds. So basically what they, you know, one of the things was, well, uh, dung beetles had a, had a, um, a habitat that they could invade if you know you quit using the ivermectin which that that is a long story but basically that original product went away and and there was a lot more concern about overuse and so a, a, a lot of opportunity then for the dung beetles to come back so there were some dung beetles of uh, the genus uh, onthophagus taurus uh, were first uh, imported into texas i believe it was and um and since that time which was about 50 years ago, they have covered the entire United States. So they're, uh, they, they're very successful. And they then, and, and because again, based on the name, you know, on the Vegas Taurus, their choice species is cattle. Um, on the Vegas gazelle is another one that we see a lot of deeper into the summer. They're larger than the Taurus, but they, you can imagine, they were they were imported from Africa, and they came in. I don't remember the details of how that one was brought in, but it was again, it was an imported one. And so the, I, as I said, the the number of beetles and the total biomass of this 
of these two Anthophagus species, at least in North Carolina, Virginia, that's that that's probably 90% um, during the summer of the beetles are one of those two types. Now that's not to say we don't find you know large populations of some different ones sometimes, and we don't really understand all of that, but uh, but certainly um, anybody in in you know anybody in this part of the country, I'm sure, can find some of these uh, these anthophagus uh, species in in their pastures. Now we do have occasionally, you know, we'll have a workshop. We do this at workshops a lot. We show we have a couple of different other demos. I'll tell you other than just the shovel thing, but we have um, we have found you know people that say, well, we don't have them and we won't want to take them home with us. You know, could we could we have some or how do we go get them? Can I buy them? Get that question a lot now by email you know where can i buy dung beetles well there actually are i think a couple of places that have kind of been off and on selling them um but we are um uh, you know the 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 under thing the thing is that we tell people well that you probably got them you need to go go see you know go scoop the shovel and see maybe you've got them and you don't know and and in many cases that is that is the case but we do have some people that have gone and they said, well, we don't have them. So the first thing is, well, why don't you have them? And a lot of times it's like, do you use ivermectin? Well, yeah, I use it every two months. Like, okay, well, uh, a lot of, a lot of horror, like, you know, horse deworming programs. It's, it's not uncommon to do about every two months with ivermectin. And um, horses are, you know, horses, horse, horse manure is, uh, is good dung beetle food as well. Uh, so, so we need to be thinking about those things. And so once they want, you know, a lot of times, maybe they don't have that. They'll, they'll talk about uh, their different practices, but, and, and some of them will take them home. And, and we know you can scoop up a, a good uh, bunch of them out of a pasture and take them. And if you'll get them uh, put out uh, within at least an hour or so of, of that, uh, you can have high survival. If not, you need to put them in a cooler and give them some air. And, you know, there's some things that you can do to keep them alive for you know a day or so but so you could if you know where there's a lot you could bring some back to your farm um but chances are if it'll support dung beetles they're already going to be there you just haven't you just haven't noticed specifically speaking of um you know the ivermectin and the effects that it can have on dung beetles if you do use it heavily um i guess that kind of ties into my next question of of uh, give us a quick life cycle um, on what the dung beetle is, because I know the ivermectin probably, it probably hurts the larvae most of the dung beetles and not necessarily the adult beetles themselves, but the larvae. So can you walk us through from, um, you know, two dung beetles meeting on a cow pie? And I, and I know some folks don't know that they fly and that's how a lot of them um, get around. So can you explain that a little bit for us? Yes. So, so again, uh, put yourself in a pasture in the middle of the summer when it's warm and moist. And when you hear a cow pie fall, uh, go watch it, okay? And uh, you'll see, of course, you'll see like, there'll be horn flies and stuff that, that like cow manure that'll be attracted to that. But you'll see these bigger flies or, what is, or something start swarming in and uh, it's dung beetles. And so they do, they fly and they, they fly from, uh, from, you know, the, the last pasture they were in, or if you're more continuous grazing, they fly, they fly around the pasture and they can smell that fresh manure and that's their stuff. And so again, they're the, the, the niche of these uh, tunnelers is to get in that real fresh manure and start, start processing it because they're competing with those dwellers that'll come in and they start doing their thing up in the, uh, up in the top of it. And, and they're all in there together. The, as they, as they, um, as you say, I don't know, um, I don't know how they get introduced and how they mate or whatever, but they, they do, they do mate. And then they dig the hole, they dig those tunnels down underneath the, um, down underneath the, the cow pie and they start laying their eggs down there. And, and the, the larva uh, develop in about uh, four weeks or so till they go to full maturity. And so by then the adult dung beetles, they work on that manure pile until it's, kind of used up you know it gets to the point it's too dry and they can't work with it as much and they they uh, they lay that last egg down there and they pop up and they're like okay i got a time for a fresh cow pie so they take to the air and they find the cows and they find that fresh cow pie and they land and do it again 
So again, as you say, the ivermectin or other potential larvicides, and, and I'll just mention there's, there's um, Altacid is one that's on the market that's a hornfly control, and then Clarifly, those are the two that are most widely used. Um, there is some research on those. Probably Altacid has a little less effect on them than Clarifly, but I'd say it's probably not enough research really to fully understand that. Anytime you feed through something that kills larvae in the feces, it's probably not good for dung beetles. Um, you know, and we can debate how how not good it is. But nevertheless, um, when you use a ivermectin, let's say you use a, a lot of people use pour on ivermectin, say in the middle of summer, it's kind of been a common recommendation. For about uh, two weeks or so after that, then there's going to be enough ivermectin in the feces to where it probably hurts those larvae that are in that. I don't know how, I don't know if it kills them all or kills part of them or most of them makes them weak or whatever, but it will affect them as long as there's ivermectin in the manure. But you haven't killed the adult and they're flying on. And so they'll continue living. So you'll have a little bit of a gap in the reproductive cycle, but you'll get past that. Okay, you'll, you'll, you'll get over that and they'll do get, they'll do good again. The adults haven't died. They're still laying eggs. You lose one little, a couple of weeks worth of, of larva. Now, if, if you go ahead and treat again, or say you're treating a feed through like a clarify, for example, that's in there all the time, then you gradually, you don't get any new brood. And the adults eventually run out of gas and, you know, and so, and so you lose your population that way. So um, we, you know, I, again, this, um, I, I don't want to condemn Clarify because it's a, it, you know, it helps a lot of people and it's not probably the worst thing in the world, but we don't, I'd say we don't understand it well enough and how uh, we need to, you know, do we need, like, like with any kind of this kind of stuff, you need to withdraw it at some, you, you know, anything you do over and over and over and over, there's eventually resistance. We know that with herbicides and everything else that we use. So probably some break from that, or maybe, maybe half the groups on your farm, you don't use it and the other half you do for a while or so, you know, I don't, I don't know how to manage around those kinds of things, but, uh, but I do know that those Anything, anything that's a larvicide that feeds through in the in the manure is probably not a great thing to have. Um, yeah, yeah, and it's you know just like like you were saying earlier, all of our farming um, practices and tools that we think is you know if little is good, then more is better, and sometimes we just need to learn how to to balance it out. Obviously, and and utilizing it every once in a while is not necessarily the worst thing in the world. Um, but like you said, maybe take a break from it every once in a while. And, and if you're looking to promote your dung beetles, um, but let's go a little bit more into some of what dung beetles can bring to the table to farmers in terms of um, their financial aspects um, and their environmental aspects. You'd already talked about that. They're great, especially the tunnelers are great at aerating the soils, but they're also taking down, I don't know what percentage 40, 40, 50% of that dung pat down into the soil where um, less nitrogen is volatilizing as easily if it was on top of the soil still. So why should farmers even care about their dung beetle populations? And, and is it enough to even, um, you know, their financial benefits, is it even enough to care about? Yeah, so that's a great question and, 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 diff and difficult one to answer, but that's okay. We'll deal with it anyway, because it is it is what we all need to be thinking about. So they have, you mentioned the benefits on soil aeration, and that's one of the big benefits. And obviously uh, that helps the growth of forages throughout the year. And so there's some benefit there. How, you know, whether it's a 10% improvement or 5% improvement or, or maybe not, maybe 1%, I don't know how much it affects, but it's positive, okay? The other part is the water capture because of the porosity. So if you think about it, those big pores are very important for air to get into the soil. But when we have a big thunderstorm in Virginia and it rains two or three inches in a half hour or an hour, which may be the only rain we get for a whole month, right? The more of those big pores you have, the, the more of that water you can take right up into the, into the sport. And it's not only about the dung beetles, it's about the earthworms and all the other soil biology that collaborate to make that pore system in the soil. But that's really important. And that may be as important as the aeration component in terms of growing grass on my farm. Because our, our, in the summer, 
rain is our limit. I mean, moisture is our limit. In fact, it's a matter of how good of the summer you have. So that's important. The third category is the nutrients. And so we we are, you know, we have a lot of people that are interested in uh, what we're, what's now being called regenerative agriculture that is, you know, it used to be called something else, but it's the same concept. We're trying to build soil fertility. We're trying to take advantage of natural nutrient cycles that occur in healthy soil. And so uh, part of that is the dung beetles have the ability to take not only nutrients from the feces, the, the, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, and the potassium, and all the micro elements as well, uh, they take that down into the soil, but they also, uh, they also take carbon into the soil with them. So they, you know, that, that, that ball that they bury has got all those nutrients plus carbon. And so that can improve your, your overall soil health, your, your, your carbon uh, in uh, deeper layers in the soil is very beneficial for, again, for this water holding capacity, water infiltration. And then we do know that, that those nutrients that are taken down there are very available and now they're deeper in the soil profile. And if you think about uh, the way the pore system in the soil works, we, we don't often picture it this way, but it, th those big pores are actually the channels that roots go down as well. And so roots, you know, root, a root's trying to go down as easy as it can get down to deeper places in the soil. And so it finds those channels and it goes down there, finds that uh, little, that little uh, eaten and then re-eaten and digested manure uh, deposit, which is basically the feces from the larva that ate the little brood ball uh, and then popped out as an adult beetle. You know, it left all that down there. And so then that plant's locked into that that nutrient source at a much deeper level than it would be if it was just something that you had applied to the surface. So again, I wish I could give you like dollars per acre or something like that. I guess you're looking for that, but I will say that the cost of having healthy dung beetles is really zero, right? It's one of those things that it's already there. It's a tool that is already in your pasture that if you'll just be aware of it and do some small things, to, you know, to think about your chemical use, think about, you know, drag it in the summer, uh, and then just kind of appreciate them a little bit more, then they're, they're going to help you year in, year out, and it's going to be a part of this healthy ecosystem. And the, value, the, 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 the dollar benefits are not so much dung beetles. It's that healthy, you know, it's that, that system that they're part of. Uh, and, uh, and, they're, and they're a key, you know. Lot, that system with a lot without some of these key species that collapses and it's just it's just not uh, not as productive right yeah no i completely agree and and it's not just necessarily focusing on uh one species like dung beetles and making sure that you have that but it's it's what dung beetles bring to the table for the soil life because i'm sure all that manure down in the soil profile is also feeding all the soil life uh, your nematodes, your bacteria, your fungus, all that stuff, which plays a huge part um, in the resilience of your soils. Um, it's also how they're helping, you know, earthworms and how they all work and collaborate together essentially to, to make a healthy soil matrix. Um, so it's not just one species that's doing all the work. Um, plus for me, I think it's just incredibly fascinating to go out and be able to identify dung beetles. And, and like you were saying, you know, kick over a cow pie and there's, you know, probably the, the most I've ever seen one of my cow pies is probably, you know, 50 or 60 in the middle of summer, but that's, that's a lot. And I know that they're doing a lot out there. So it's always really exciting to see. Um, one last question before I let you go. And I know you're, you're busy, busy farmer, like the rest of us, but what's, you've already kind of touched on it a little bit, but what are some things that we can do to maybe promote dung beetles? I know we'd already talked about not maybe using insecticides or um, pesticides on a continual basis and not dragging your pastures during the summer because that's when most of our species are most active. Is there anything else that we can do as farmers to maybe help promote those populations in our own, own pastures? Well, so I think that um, one thing we've noticed and uh, and again, I, you know, some, you make some observations and then we have research to back up some of it. This is something I don't have a good backup for this, but we seem to see the highest populations where we have the highest quality forages. So 
um, they they really seem to respond. Well, we have you know in the spring on some on winter annuals, for example, coming out of the spring on ryegrass and some of the you know, that's where we have uh, they first show up in May and they just there's they're just really a lot of them and they really seem to really like that. So I think stressing forage quality that they uh, you know that 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 turns. Uh, that changes when it goes into the feces. It's it's higher, you know. It's better quality feed for dung beetles, I think. So, the better quality the forage, the better that the dung beetles are gonna are gonna be. The other thing is that um, that is really important, and we're starting to realize this now. Is that this this not this um, toxic fescue, Kentucky Thirty One, is um, in, in many of the folks listening to this will know what that is and they know that it has toxins in there and it was unintended to be released you know um, it was released after we knew that and stuff so it's a big problem that we all face and so some recent research showed that dung beetles can tell and so we we um we did some work where we had uh we had dung beetles that were grown uh, in the lab either on feces that came from cows on kentucky 31 or feces from cows that were on novel end of fight, tall fescue, Max-Q2, uh, Texoma, or, uh, or the original Max-Q. I mean, we did, uh, we did some, several studies with different varieties and that sort of thing. And, and boy, the dung beetles can tell. So if you give them a choice, they choose novel end of fight, tall fescue feces to, to, to do their brooding. If you force them uh, into one or the other, then they're much more productive in the novel endophyte than they are in the toxic fescue uh, feces. They have, uh, the, the, the larvae just don't develop normally in those, uh, in those that are on toxic fescue. And so uh, it, it, that stuff has dramatic effects all through the ecosystem in this, these pastures. And so, um, you know, we, we, we understand, I, I work with a group called the Alliance for Grassland Renewal. And uh, we, we really are trying to get uh, this, do something about the toxic fescue uh, uh, situation, whether it's to learn how to manage it better or to replace it in where it makes sense. And especially where we're like converting old cropland and stuff like that, there's no reason to plant toxic fescue. And so we're working on getting that appropriate adoption level. And um, we, we, so we, 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 were involved in that research uh, that, that was really some inter interesting entomology stuff that was that was uh, that was done here here recently. But we've got a workshop uh, actually uh, coming up in March in Virginia at uh, at Virginia State, and uh, and so we'll be there looking at uh, looking at uh, novel endophyte in the field, and we'll probably be looking at dung beetles too that day. But because uh, they're always there, and we always talk, I'm, people accuse me of being. Uh, of being, uh, you know, too focused on dung beetles, but I'm, that's my, maybe that's my hobby, but anyway. Awesome. Um, so we, so, so basically one thing you can do is to, is to, uh, you know, to use, use some novel end to fight tall fescue and other stuff in your diverse mixes and don't plant Kentucky 31. It's as simple as that. You, you may, you may be able to live with what you've got, but there's not a reason to plant uh, more yeah, that's super interesting. I hadn't even that wasn't even a thought that I've heard of about the uh, the toxic fescue. So it's not only toxic to cattle; it's also probably not the best for the uh, dung beetles either. If they're the larvae aren't developing um, as they sh could be if they were in different novel novel fescue. So that's that's interesting, and that's another uh, push for not planting your K thirty one anymore. <laughs> um, well, real fast. <laughs> I'll send you the paper on that because it is. Yeah, that would be awesome. That would be awesome. Um, you had mentioned that you're going to have a workshop in March for the Alliance for Grass and Renewal on um, establishing novel fescues in your pasture. Is the Amazing Grazing uh, going to have any programs this spring or summer focused on dung beetles? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so glad glad you mentioned that because we are um, – we are doing uh, our normal, we're, we're, we're out there, we're going to do a lot of educational stuff this year. You know, pandemic kind of was a lull for us, but we were fired back up here. We're going to be, uh, we're going to be doing workshops all over North Carolina. And uh, we are going to have an online uh, webinar uh, series in April that is going to be uh, three nights in April. It's a, it's a pasture, it's called Pasture and Land Ecology webinar series. 
And basically, we're going to take the, uh, the subject matter that we use for our national pasture land ecology course we teach for NRCS, and that'll be uh, shortened a little bit to, a, uh, to more of a producer target audience. And, um, and that'll be, so, so we'll have, uh, I'll be speaking along with uh, some of our, my colleagues, you know, Johnny Rogers, that does a lot of temporary fence stuff, and Dr. Alan Franz Lubers, who's a uh, soil, soil ecologist that works in soil health. And, uh, and then we'll have also a horse, our horse specialist, Dr. Paul Siciliano, and a small ruminant specialist, Andrew Weaver. So we'll, we're going to have a great, uh, great series. And then we're going to, to complement that, we'll have some workshops across the, the, the state. And, and we do some similar kind of programming with Virginia Tech and others as well. So, um, so that, that all, it all ties together. And so that, um, that particular webinar series is going to be recorded and then offered later as a course as well. So if those, you know, April's not the greatest time to get farmers uh, in a chair, uh, but maybe in the evening we can get as much of that as we can. And then folks will be able to go back and access this as an online course at a later date um, as they get the interest in it. So, that's the thing I would I would say uh, we we do uh, for our workshops we do a few demos uh, in addition to the shovel thing as I mentioned we do have uh, what we call a dung beetle bucket bucket demonstration and so this is where you take uh, and you stand out there with the cows or the horses or whatever until you get the very fresh stuff you know and get it and get it into a bag so nothing can get in it and then you find yourself uh, whatever the dung beetles are that are there in that in that pasture in, in a good number. And you collect them and, and, you know, I usually have them like in a styrofoam uh, coffee cup with poles in it. So they live for at least for a while. And then I take and I make a cow pie uh, on the top of a bucket full of uh, that's like mixed potting soil and sand mixed together. And I make a cow pie in each of two buckets. And then I release the dung beetles into one of the cow pies and then cover both buckets with a, with what's a, um, uh, we use the best thing we found to use is a uh, weed control uh, cloth that you would use like in your around your house or something to keep weeds from coming up through. It's got air can get up through it, but the dung beetles can't get through it. So we just put it and tie it around with a big rubber, a big, like a big rubber band around the top of that bucket. And then we let them work. And, and so especially when we have longer term workshops, we have, uh, you know, our national schools a couple of weeks. We watch those every day. But if you're having a workshop out in, on your farm or something, you can set those up a couple of days before and then open them up. And, you know, the, the, un, the, the no dung beetles, just like a cow pie and the other side, uh, you see, you can really see the effects. And so that, that one, I like that one a lot. Um, we also then carry on with some groups. We will have those buckets and just let them work. And then about three weeks later, we'll, we will uh, release the dung beetles. And then we'll turn them upside down and go through and look at the, the brood balls down in the bottom and, uh, and some larva and stuff like that. So, so you can, again, and that's a, that's a great kids activity there that they, they, can, they, they really like that. One of the things that I, that, you, you know, you have, when you have plans like that, and then obviously mother nature doesn't read your plan. And sometimes we'll go out and they're like, we'll be no Anthophagus taurus. Uh, for some, you know, we just see gaps in the population. Sometimes we can't find them, and so uh, one one time we had a situation like that. But I found at the horse farm we found some dwellers that were in uh, in horse manure, and and so I collected a bunch of those dung beetles and and got some fresh fresh horse uh, road apples, you know, and and gosh, within like two days they were completely gone. It was like this fluff in the top of the bucket, and the other ones were just. And it was more dramatic than anything we'd done with Anthophagus taurus. So those were one of the one of the more uh, uh, the more obscure dweller species, and they they did that shredding thing, which uh, you see that a lot in horse horse manure in the summertime. You know, you see it just all of a sudden. It just like within three days it'll blow away, and that's what's going on. That's awesome, and I, I I'm gonna have to try this experiment uh, <laughs> later on the spring or summer too, because that sounds it's a great visual, you know. Again, to to be able to be like this is the comparison between dung beetles and no dung beetles, and um, so that again it helps demystify what they're doing out there. That's awesome. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the most sophisticated one probably, and I'll then I'll shut up. But this <laughs> told you it was kind of my hobby, but. I had one of my colleagues uh, named Dr. Sharon Freeman that, that got into this and 
she built a, a what what she called a dung beetle farm and it was like an ant farm you might have had as a kid and so um it's like a little extra large one but but anyway she put the dung beetles in there and then we uh, when they were done, she used um, uh, like a thin plaster of Paris uh, solution and poured it over the surface and it went down into all the tunnels. And then she cleaned all the, the sand and stuff off of that. And we have that cast and it's just, it just blow your mind, you know? So we, so a lot of times we'll have the little dung beetle farm set up and then we'll have this cast that she made from that same, that same deal. And that again, is- it's lots, lots of oohs and ahs from... <laughs> Yeah, I love that. I love that. That's so cool. Well, uh, Dr. Poor, if folks do want to reach out to you or if they want to find out more about these workshops or webinars that you've been talking about, can they go to NC State's uh, website online or do you have an email address? Yeah, so NC State Beef Extension is our is your best way to get to our stuff. Uh, we also have our own web page is, uh, is Amazing Grazing page under the CEFS program. So if you do CEFS and Amazing Grazing, you'll find it. Um, we have, like I said, there's a lot of resources there. I am, I do have, uh, you know, email like everybody else. And I, you know, within reason, I try to get everybody responded to, but uh, uh, we have a lot of traffic on that. But uh, it's mhpoor at ncstate.edu. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing uh, your knowledge today. It was above and beyond a lot of stuff that I've tried to research. It's really hard to research dung beetles, actually. there's I don't think there's a lot going on in the States, at least, with uh, dung beetle research. And so really happy and, and grateful and thankful that you have been doing this for quite some time and have quite the background and wealth of knowledge. So really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you.